So as far as development of any discipline of humanities is concerned, where do you think India stands and is India contributing enough upon its capacity? Why haven't uh, we had institutions as at par with Oxford or Cambridge till now? I don't know whether we should be at par with either Cambridge or Oxford, but uh, there are many things which uh, we in fact did inherit from Cambridge. As I have told you, uh, the economic history, industrialization history of India was the thesis that Gargill submitted to Cambridge University. So, it's, not, it's a question of uh, a very long lag in development of the kind of modern uh, education institutions, the capacity and the kind of funding that was needed for this purpose. You see, what happened in England is something which is often not comparable with India for a simple reason that Cambridge, Oxford had a uh, long inherited uh, legacy of nearly probably 800 years. So they were mostly in 13th century institutions, mostly meant for the promotion and training of Christian doctrines because they are very essentially Christian institutions, the idea of college, university, they were all oriented towards training the uh, those people who were supposed to serve Christianity and spread Christianity. The nature of researches that existed in Cambridge in those times also suffered from this, but did not suffer as much because they were uh, under some kind of a pretext surviving as if they were having an alliance with that Christian motive. Probably the most striking example would be Sir Isaac Newton. Newton was a person who did not believe in Trinity, but he was the most celebrated figure of Cambridge. And his Principia Mathematica became in fact a matter of pride for Cambridge, for, and it continues to be a matter of pride for Cambridge even now. But if you look at uh, Newton's secret religious writings, they were totally against what Cambridge was otherwise doing and preaching. And this is something which is a less known history. So since Newton, till that time, you know, because these educational institutions had a very strong religious rooting and a religious framework for their functioning, that sort of, sort of institution which prevailed in India was more or less eliminated, partly because of not enough government support, partly because the nature of education that they were imparted had become, become, become somewhat uh, outdated or outlandish. And because of the lack of support uh, that was needed in the size and the quantum that was needed, even these institutions did not flourish as much as they could have readily flourished or expanded or multiplied. So in, in a way, there is a historical handicap that we did suffer. In terms of emulating the kind of discipline and the kind of research work that the modern kind of uh, sciences and inquiries prompted, I don't think we were too much lagging in terms of ability to match in terms of skills, in terms of abilities. For example, there are many sciences in which I think we were at par. As increasingly the technology and technological backup needed for a variety of modern science disciplines started becoming increasingly exclusively dependent on the government support. Yeah. Our ability to make strides in those regions has been much more lax. So one of the reasons is, of course, the poor funding and very uh, peculiar, awkward attitude towards making a decision of what kind of research to fund. For example, in 50s, people seriously believed that uh, supporting something like a fundamental research was not really needed. And, and I think there is, there is a very large section of, uh, even among the universities, who believe that probably what we should do and what we should be funding uh, in terms of priority that needs to be reoriented. Because people can legitimately ask the question that, suppose astrophysics, do we have an immediate impact on that on development in catching up the gap and meeting the gap? So those kinds of controversies did affect the funding as well. And I don't think uh, in terms of capabilities, we were much less. In fact, I think we, we still continue to be equally matching. When it comes to social sciences, it was even more uh, very vague kind of an atmosphere because people were not able to realize what significance the social sciences can and should have. And there are, of course, many other influences. We are you are referring to Cambridge and Oxford, but that is probably also in a way outdated. 
present intellectual atmosphere prevailing in West, which many of the so-called social scientists seem to be following, is not so much due to Cambridge and Oxford, but there is a lot more which is coming from many other centers, most notably uh, various French schools working in social sciences, <coughs> or their branches as they spread to American universities, for example, Harvard or MIT. I think that carries a lot more influence. And probably the nature of orientation, which was very deeply rooted in knowledge of empirical matters, uh, historical veracity, as it was there in the 50s and 60s, has gradually waned. And the social scientists have probably been more engaged in looking at the fresh reality with their own fresh access to data, observing facts, collecting facts, trying to inquire deeper. That has diminished. Something that was dominant in the from the 1940s to uh, say almost 1980s, that generation has in fact disappeared, mm -hmm. and requirement to look at freshly, look at on a first-hand basis. For example, primary surveys conducted with the depth and seriousness as it happened in Gokhale Institute or it happened in ISI or it happened in uh, very various other centers. I think that has more or less stopped because social scientists have become increasingly over dependent on the nature of secondary data that is more readily available. Consequence is they simply use that data and fit whatever arguments that could be made and that would be more in tune with the nature of uh, currents that are more popular uh, abroad, notably in some centers, uh, influenced by structuralism, post-structuralism and what not. And so all these are the uh, kinds of uh, streams of thought that has overtaken the nature of social science research in India at the cost of being uh, separated away, divorced away from the harsh actual social reality. And that has become a kind of a uh, game in itself. So what the social scholars mean and think and talk about, it has become almost an exclusive private professional language which they themselves know and they themselves debate without having much uh, tangible, palpable and sensible kind of implication of nature of social policy. So that is perhaps the most worrying feature of the Indian social science research today. Because people are not interested in looking at uh, reality with their own way, with the independently and not overburdened by the terminology which people often confuse with the conceptual framework. Many of them don't even adhere to that conceptual framework seriously and consistently. But that vocabulary has changed and that, that is overburdened with the vocabulary. It doesn't have its own fresh content It doesn't because it doesn't have its own fresh observations and insights into even the already known data. And that is one of the major uh, deficiencies. And again, one asks the question, why don't they collect on their own data? Firstly, there is an overhang and there is kind of a uh, hangover of influences of the kinds of questions that should be asked, posed, collected. There are many other uh, techniques of collecting a different kind of a data in a slightly different technical manners as well by probing different kinds of questions than the conventional questions that have become. Like for example, many universities follow this uh, practice of asking what is going to your sample, what is going to your questionnaire without even asking whether the relevant subject as the same kind of a preconceptualized questionnaire relevant for it, preconceptualized idea of sample relevant for it. So changing your method and modes of even statistical inquiry or a conceptual inquiry, depending on the nature of question and the reality that you are confronting, that has gone down and the relevance of that and the emphasis on that has diminished. That's one of the major bane of the current social science research in India. Okay. Since you are connected with two of the most prestigious uh, research institutions in Pune, rather India, what do you feel about the current research pace? Where do you think, uh, where do you see India in next 10 years in research? I don't think there is a great uh, forecast which is so easy to make, partly because I hope that uh, something of this sort happens, as I've indicated in the uh, my earlier response. See, the nature of uh, data observation, collection, co collation of facts and making sense of those facts 
they will be are are getting revolutionized with the advent of new technologies particularly the information technology so the for example the idea of crop cutting survey to estimate yields per hectare not irrelevant but that can be matched mm -hmm. uh, with different supporting kind of techniques of inquiry either mm -hmm. so probably you can have crop cutting surveys at finite number of points for finite kinds of crops but there are many crops like for example you take the principal crops that principal 35 crops for agriculture for which crop cutting surveys are made the credibility and the reliability of data has diminished how do you counter check this with reality there are many statistical techniques now available with very few questions you would be able to in fact generate data and get validation or otherwise of the kind of data that is published by government itself so the kind of big data revolution which is occurring in almost every field and mostly this is because of thanks to new kind of information technology and processing the data processing capacities uh, i don't think they have reached social science research sufficiently in india and this is not only to social science research there are several branches in natural sciences where it, this should also percolate very deeply at very different types for example take uh, the questions of ecological and envir environmental data we have not really seriously thought of how to apply these new kinds of uh, data science tools or the data gathering capacity tools that the it has generated for us and are these uh, the scientists or those uh, research students are they getting trained for this purpose are they making imaginative use of these kinds of things for for this purpose this is something which deserves to be introspected very seriously one major area where i think the government we should have taken a lead and we need not necessarily wait for the government lead in fact i'm pretty sure at one point of time when archaeological survey of india as a institution existed there are several people who used to make study on their own discover their own studies report it to archaeological survey mm -hmm. there are many studies in the history which have happened where people have discovered number of things in the region for which there was not a very great data or very, very great government support for example take the institution like agarkar research uh, institution in pune they they have the plant scientist who made the surveys for example people often because i am from pune let me talk about pune there was a great botanist called vd vartak who used to first work with ferguson college later joined agarkar research it was in those times called maharashtra association of cultivation of sciences institute he made the survey of trees in pune okay a survey in the sense of census he made a census of that in pune there are several kinds of species and uh, varieties of these species that was discovered by himself as well as variety of his students so much so that the international nomenclature gives the credit for this for example there is a student of his whose name was kulkarni therefore it is kulkarnesis that's the way in which the variety of the species that was discovered by him in western ghats is named internationally mm -hmm. so uh, there are many such kinds of researches which are feasible and now we should uh, be bold enough to admit that entirely relying on the government funding alone is not sensible is not enough okay. whatever you call it you you can mobilize many sources of funding but have be more imaginative be more innovative and try to think for those kinds of observations which are not readily available and, and therefore don't have excessive reliance of what is available as secondary data already recorded that needs a revision imagine for example had rauri krushi vidyapeeth established what can be called as the weather research station centers of their own much more than what they have accomplished so far probably would have a very different kind of a data where different kind of ability to forecast the local forecast for for example temperature temperature variation or sudden kind of events that are that can occur or the prediction of rains recording of rains recording of rainfall gauges in each of the villages even different parts of the given topography these kind of efforts don't really require a huge government scheme to implement even the local governments can do it for it their own sake so it would be far more sensible to delegate this task to the gram panchayat and the local maybe taluka level college to collect such kind of data 
they can inspect the data on, for example, the farmers produce vegetables and there is an excessive use of maybe insecticide and pesticide. What is the residue level for which crop in which region? Does one require a great lab for this? It does not. Even a college lab with few equipments added could be equipped enough so as to make them the centers which can certify for the residue certification. Yeah. If we can do it for some crops like grapes, some crops uh, of certain types which we export, why can't we have these established centers in the rural colleges themselves? This can be one of the routine activity and this would be what is an idea of community college in those times. So having the weather station and weather research on the, on the local basis with whatever uh, delimitation that you want to, uh, you are able or capable of covering and collecting, generating data on its own is a great thing which can be done on the, with the new technologies which does not necessarily cost too much. So it is not only social sciences, also think of natural sciences in this. For example, variety of health related parameters and medical data probably can be more easily collected on routine basis. Yeah. Now almost at least at, in some of the states like Maharashtra or Karnataka or Gujarat, almost every taluka has a college, every, every taluka has a science college. So we are, we have stopped thinking about the institutional innovations and what institutions are capable of doing, not necessarily leading to a degree, maybe a diploma, maybe generating skills of certain types which are locally relevant as well as nationally or regionally relevant. So it is not merely the social sciences which are suffering from this kind of a short-sightedness that we are currently operating with, but also the natural sciences do. Okay. So, how far is the country's current political makeup affecting the research, especially in history, public policy and economics? I think I have partly answered this because we have become over dependent on government grant, government certification, government approvals. Uh, let me give you an example. Now, the, uh, you know, under new economic policy, there is a great flexibility available for the, the institutions, the educational institution, colleges for example. They don't know what kind of a thing they should offer as a course which can lead to formation of certain kind of a skill, which would be beneficial at various levels. Because in fact, the NDP policy now says that if you, if for, for example, suppose if I start, we have BSc electronics and BSc electricals. In what way we can have a supplementary courses, which could be very naturally given the nature of discipline, would be vocationally oriented. And not necessary that everyone should become a BSc graduate in electronics or electricals. They can become uh, uh, good professionals up to a certain level of skill and as they acquire that they can have, they can join and join back and leave and join back. Mm. This is a flexibility allowed by the NEP but ask the college or the colleges which are now given the option of floating these kind of courses. What imaginative effort have they applied? Have they applied their mind? For example, there is a component called Indian knowledge system which has been supposed to be one of the characteristic of new, uh, new education policy. How many colleges have uh, even the elementary awareness about what Indian knowledge was and what Indian knowledge could be? Because one is not asking for being stagnant of what our forefathers did 800 years back, 200 years back or 2000 years back. Indian knowledge system is Indian knowledge system. If there is a local knowledge of certain kind of a type, and if that is which is uh, found to be relevant, for example, there are many local remedies. What are the plants which are useful for the local remedies for treating certain kind of health ailments? These are only locally available. Yeah. Why not a local college take lead in making a documentation of these kinds of so-called local remedies, their sources in terms of plants? For example, Rani Bank uh, and Abai Bank. They made this kind of an effort in Gadchiroli and she has in fact published a book which compiles uh, from the interviews whatever those uh, uh, tribal ladies told her that what kind of uh, medicinal or therapeutic substance they use when they suffer from this element. An excellent kind of a compilation. Making compilation is one stage just if it works there is a further biochemistry question which the local college should address. And that is also Indian knowledge system. It is not necessarily that you have to look back 2000 years back or 800 years back and say that Bhaskaracharya knew this or Charak knew this. There are many local Charaks available. Maybe they are not as extensive as Charakis, but there is a local practice that is a part of our inherited 
traditional know-how. Documenting that, making it refined, making it adaptable and extensive, uh, more uh, flexibly applicable, usable, is also part of Indian knowledge system. I have not come across many college principals or college professors who think of IKS like this. And I think that's, that is going to make that policy appear appearing failure. It is an institutional failure. Because the people who are supposed to do the, and undertake the kind of initiative and the kind of vision, flexible vision, equipped vision, innovative vision that they are supposed to have, that is something which is lacking in our educational institution because college principal is more bothered about what, whether the joint director of education has approved this post, whether they should intimate so many dates before so that the grant comes in time. I think we are become excessively bureaucratic in these matters because we are exclusively dependent on government and fund and government fund alone. I think there is a great deal of scope where even after receiving, for example, I, I was teaching for years together, decades together in many educational institutions in Pune. For whatever salary that they were making, I think my capacities were not utilized, they were not justifying my salary. Had they asked me to, in fact, teach through three more subjects in my college, I would have taught them. But the colleges said, no, no, this is not part of your workload. If you are also asked to teach this, then what will happen to that person? I am not asking for additional workload or additional salary. But if I am available, make use of me. Mm -hmm. Make those kinds of barriers that the earlier system of government approval made it so rigid and make it innovative. Uh, you can have a multi-talented kind of uh, teachers, even in social sciences. Why should you have separate departments for political science and economics? As if economics is undoable for political scientists and vice versa. I don't see. Sociology, history, two subjects which are kind of subjects meant only for students who don't consider themselves capable enough. Yeah. Why? And those who are the history students, what do they know of history? Except the printed books in the history recommended as per whatever uh, Board of Studies has read. There are so many kind of historical sources. How do you read them? For example, is teaching of Modi the language in which all the documents in parts of Karnataka and Maharashtra 200 years back, all the records historical are available in this script. It also requires the familiarity with Persian. Do our histori history departments capable of teaching these skills so that they can read and find out what the original evidence exists? Even on fragmentary basis, I am not asking him to do a PhD, but if, I, if he gets from his own family some old record, would he be able to read that document because it is in Farsi or in Modi? He won't be. I think there are many avenues where one can apply the open mind and the innovative mind with the new kind of a technology. I think we as teachers have become substantially redundant. So it is better that the teachers themselves become alert to this fact that there are even far better teachers across the globe available which the students can watch, listen to, take notes from, solve their problems, take even courses on the channels such as Coursera. So in a way, the colleges will become redundant if they continue to think in the same manner. And I would be happy if I become redundant like this as a teacher because I would be free for doing something else that I am otherwise not very, very much interested in doing in the future times to come. Yeah. So that is something which is an institutional gap and institutional deficiency that we are suffering from. And that needs to be addressed. Okay. And just imagine when getting a book used to take at least six months. Okay? Because it used to come via boat. Because that was the only kind of a way of getting something which is in physical form. The books used to come in physical form. So it would take six months lag. Imagine that when a person like Richard Burton a very uh, unique kind of a figure in history. Okay? He compiled something what is called Arabian Nights. Yeah. He went there from India, from Bombay. He traveled to Makkah in a disguise because only Muslims were allowed there. And he compiled all this and published it. And within few two years of his publication of this book, Krishna Shastriji Purunkar could write the entire summary of those stories in Marathi, published by Chitrashala Press. Six months lag in a book could produce, could be followed by a book in Marathi. You get now almost anything instantaneously on internet and that too in a form which is very easy to even turn around, make something of it and I don't know what the future would be with uh, something like chat GPT tools. 
what, what are we, what is holding us back? What is holding us back is a courage. What is holding us back of our aversion for innovation. And I think people there were industrious enough to translate a book available within six months time and render it into Marathi, at least communicate its content in Marathi. There was a person called Bal, Bal Shastri Zambekar who used to publish, uh, had started publishing a newspaper called Darpat. He is therefore called the founder of uh, modern journalism in Marathi. He used to write on this that how a new kind of a boat is being envisaged and how it functions. The same person also wrote first small Marathi booklet on what is called differential calculus. It is called Shunya Labdi Ganit because the limit goes, it tends to zero. That is the one of the essential thing in calculus. He could write it, why, what prevents our teachers, what prevents our even uh, more enthusiastic students to write on by themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that is something which I have to think about. So that is something to be learned from the past, from the institutional heritage, that the people were open, they had a great pride in their own tradition. They were also equally aware and critical of the deficiencies our Indian society as a society have had. They criticized as well. But at the same time, they were doing a marvelous kind of a job, ignited by someone else at part of the globe, but they were capable of very creatively applied to the local history, local condition or the national condition. Take for example, Bhandarkar or take for example, Lokmani Tilak. They were equally nationalist, but that did not prevent them from thinking the way in which the new modern technology was suggesting, new modern evidences were suggesting. They did not turn their back to it. They in fact utilized it to expand their and deepen their own thought. So that is something to be learned from history of institutions. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Uh, and you shared great insights about what we have Thanks. to think in future. Uh, stay tuned with Chodiko for more. <laughs>